Hello, everybody, and um, welcome back to The Seditionists. It's been a while. Uh, Keith and I have had a uh, very busy uh, post, post uh, January time, and uh, we're just sort of getting the groove back on. We'll, we're both looking a little uh, casual <laughs> today. This is Friday, and it's been a very long week for both of us. But, but that's excellent for you as the audience, because that means we're particularly grumpy and really ready to <laughs> get in there and get some things going. Um, so uh, welcome back. And I'm going to turn it over to Keith, and he has a guest for us today as well. Keith. Hey friends, Keith Reeves here. I am here with my lovely and fabulous colleague, Meredith Allen. We actually met together working in Prince William County and now work together in Arlington. Um, you may know if you are a fellow this year, Meredith is on the conference committee. Yes. What is your role with the conference committee? I am on the logistics committee. Awesome. Yes. Um, she's a fellow educational technologist. And uh, today it sounds like we're going to tackle a question that we got asked quite a bit when Rob and I presented together at the conference at VISTE. We got a lot of very positive feedback. Um, and it's something that I hear about my book. I'm sure that Rob has heard it about some of the things he talks about as a revolutionary. Um, the issue of application of the revolutionary ideas in the schools that exist today. We do want to talk about large scale systemic change. We do want to talk about fundamentally changing schools. But what can individual teacher practitioners do right now in their classrooms to do some of the things we talk about in the extant structure of the K-12 environment? And uh, as Rob mentioned, we're, we're all a little tired and a little grumpy. So this is probably a good opportunity to tackle yet? that, right? Oh my gosh. Tap, tap, time's a wasting. <laughs> so. Uh, which, which one of those items shall we tackle first, Rob? Well, I will. Um, th my first thought was just the other day I did a, a webinar for the um, school library journal. I think it's called. Uh, it's it's one of the big national groups, and we had a webinar, and um, we were given ideas of ways to use technology to help reluctant readers get involved more. And um, a lot of the a lot of the responses we got via Q and A um, section was, you know, where do we find the time? How are we possibly going to do this? If a kid really doesn't want to read, how are we going to get them to read? Um, when we talked about those things in the Future Ready uh, uh, conferences that you and I just uh, just did presentations, you know, we always hear the but, but, but. And that's fine. I get it. I want to do that too. But I get a little frustrated because there's so many easy ways to say that's too hard or but this is an excuse, but that's an excuse. We as a country and as an educational system have got to stop making excuses. They are the easy road out. If this was the easy road, then everybody would be doing it. Education is supposed to be challenging, folks. It's supposed to be for those of us that want to get dirty and get busy and help kids. It's not supposed to be an easy job. And yes, we can make, we can make a million excuses as to why we shouldn't try something or don't want to try something because maybe it's going to be difficult or maybe we will end up not having time to do it or not having money to do it. But that's not an excuse to, tr to not try. And that's where I'm really getting tired of hearing the, the, the whole reasoning of, but this, but that. Yeah, we could do that. We could butt ourselves to death and never get anything done and changed. we got to take that first step. We've got to be willing to say, yeah, it might hurt a little bit. Change hurts but we've got to start somewhere. Keith. I can't Andrew. help but think when we talk about um, the, the excuses that we hear, I like to repeat them back to people when I hear them, and I'm sure that you hear the same things. We, we work with a, a wide variety of teachers, some very new and young and enthusiastic, but some that have been in the schools that they've taught in for, for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Um, but I have all these great resources that I'm using since the mid-90s that work really well. You have resources that you're using that you haven't changed since the mid 90s. And you just say it back to them. Do you hear how absurd that sounds? As if students haven't changed, circumstances haven't changed, the curriculum hasn't changed. That drives me absolutely bonkers. I get, as you said, Rob, that change is hard. And I understand that there is a certain natural conservatism when you're comfortable. You know, going outside of your comfort zone can be challenging. But don't we have an ethical imperative and a moral responsibility to respond to the fact that the world and our students are changing, that the individual student sitting in front of me isn't the same kid from 1995? 
A good example of one of those things that we're talking about is keyboarding skills. And Meredith and I just had a really interesting conversation uh, the other day with a wide variety of stakeholders on this very topic. And uh, how would you say the, 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 the people who were saying they wanted these skills were putting it? I mean, what was the issue they were? The issue is they want their children to be able to, you know, type with a specific hand position. They want to know where the keys are. And I think sometimes it comes from a place where when they were in school, this is what they learned. This is the skills they want. They had, they want the same for their children, which I completely respect and understand, but things have evolved so much. And I think sometimes um, if you ask the students, they're okay with it. They don't mind typing on an iPad or something. They don't necessarily need a keyboard. It just depends on the kid. So I think it's what the parents want. They think is best for their children. When in essence, sometimes that's great, but the kids may not need it. Oh, you hit me. You hit me with one. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew you were going to uh -oh. get on that. Uh -oh. Hold on. Let me get ready here. He <laughs> Because here, here's the thing that you, here's what I just heard you say. Parents are saying we want our kids to have keyboarding. Mm -hmm. Although the kids probably realize they don't need keyboarding. The true educators who understand the ability to look maybe even a year or two into the future, we all realize keyboarding is not going to exist very soon. I could talk into the air and have answers question uh, answer questions answered for me through Alexa. Um, I can get Dragon naturally speaking and never have to touch a keyboard. So we all know realistically that's going to be a total waste of time. Now, here's my question for you. If you go to a doctor and the doctor says you need surgery, are you going to say, yeah, but you know what? 30 years ago, my dad had something similar and he didn't have surgery. Or, or if you go to a... Uh, a financier and he says, look, if you don't pull your money out soon, you're going to lose it all. Are you going to say, mm, you know what? I, I just don't think so. I don't think that's going to happen. Education is the only medium that I can figure out where everybody has had an experience with it. Yes. So they all feel like they're an expert in some way or the other. Yes, absolutely. But at the end of the day, We've gone to school for these things, which means we know more maybe a little bit than you do as a parent, even though I know you've gone through school, that does not make you an educational expert. It makes you somebody that has had an experience, but you have not had the schooling and the intellectual uh, opportunities that we've had to learn a little bit more. We're giving you these opinions as experts. What are your thoughts? Absolutely. Uh, yes, 100%. 100%. And I think it's sometimes hard to convey that because that is sometimes not seen. Yeah. The, yeah. the idea that um, I think the phrase that I use in the book is people who have been schooled think that that allows them to school, you know, but that's not at all it. We've studied you know, pedagogy, child development, child neuropsychology, classroom management, content areas, how to administer a school, um, how to draw relevant curricular connections, how to assess in a meaningful way. None of those things are, are necessarily a part of parenting. It's not to say that parents don't have a fundamentally important role to play in the lives of children. Nobody's saying that. But what we are saying is, yes, you know your child, but that's not the same as knowing how to teach your child. That's not, not the same thing as saying, I know your child's brain. Just as you said, the, the doctor analogy is a really good one, Rob. You're not going to say, well, I know my child's cerebral cortex better than any random neurosurgeon. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But that's analogous to what we hear. You don't say, I know my house better than any stupid firefighter, so I'll put out my own fire. You call the professionals. But as you rightly say, education is the only sphere where we treat things that way. So you get these, like we and I talk about regularly, 21st century skills that we know can, like 20th century skills that no longer need to have the impulse and weight that they do. And we here's one of those things to bring things full circle. Something we can apply today is maybe we're going to cut this particular thing out of our curriculum. Maybe we don't need to teach home row keys. I don't type with home row keys, and I type like 120 words a minute, you know? Yeah. What are those immediate application things? Absolutely. Okay, well, that, that was a good rant. I'm not even sure we, we ended up on the original topic. What was our original <laughs> topic to talk about? But we, we have a tendency to do that. The uh, uh, one thing I, I would like to wrap up with is uh, let's each one of us, there's three of us here, which is kind of cool. I like having you here, Meredith. Um, oh, let's each give one thing that we could do or we could offer to parent or teachers to do 
to help initiate that change. That was our original topic was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people saying, yeah, but that whole thing. So, so let's, let's just wrap it up with that. Here's the one thing I want to give teachers. Um, it's a very simple change, but it will make a big impact. When you write your lesson plans, and you know everybody's lesson plans across the nation are, are in different formats, but for yourself, not for anybody else, but just for yourself, put one line on there and write, what 21st century skill is this lesson going to touch? Collaboration, communication, digital citizenry, uh, information technology. I mean, there's, there's about... 15 of them out there and if you don't have them I'll be more than happy to send them to you just contact with me via Twitter or Keith and we'll get you the list but you know if you could just be cognizant of these skills these 21st century skills exist and I probably should be touching on them and just put that one line in your lesson plan I think you'd be amazed to see how much of a benefit you're gonna give to these kids who this is this is what they're gonna need in the future Keith and Meredith Oh, this is a tough one because there's so many things I could say. Um, <laughs> I think when I when I when a teachers come in and say, you know, I saw this great idea, or I want to do this, or I want to do that, I think they get very overwhelmed with all the possibilities. And I think my advice would be just pick one thing or one goal of something that you want to work towards that year, that specific year or for that specific semester, um, and work with your school-based technology person or whatever that goal is. But um, work with that person and then try to come up with some sort of very simple plan. You don't have to go over the top. Just do something different and do a simple change. That's what I would say. Unsurprisingly to people who are <laughs> followers of my work, I'm going to throw one out here that I use a lot. Stop grading homework. Oh. That'd be one of my big ones. Now, I didn't say stop evaluating homework, didn't say stop assessing homework, I didn't say stop using homework as a meaningful way to have kids practice, but if you stop grading it, you can give less to the kids who don't need as much, maybe more and more targeted to the kids who do it, and it doesn't have to be any additional work for you. But if you stop punishing students for compliance with a productivity mindset that is a 19th century mindset, and start focusing on what skills you really need to hone in on, not only will you save yourself work and your kids' frustration, but you'll have a more accurate understanding of what your kids are doing in your classroom. Take that to the bank. All right. Love it. I love it. I always love talking with you. Very thank passionate. You. Very passionate <laughs> here, folks. Thank, thank you, Meredith. I appreciate you uh, joining us. You're welcome to join us anytime. Uh, Keith, love you as always, buddy. You too, buddy. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to put another one of these videos out in a couple weeks. We'll get the ball rolling again. But uh uh, for the seditionists, Keith Reeves and myself and our guest, Meredith Allen, thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you want to get in contact with us, we'll be rolling the credits at the end, and you'll be able to get mine and Keith's website. We both have books out, as well as our Twitter account and so forth. So thank you. God bless, and uh, keep teaching.